All right, and part two, my narcissistic relationship. I have struggled so hard to talk about it. I just I have a lot of trouble because a lot of it I didn't want to believe. It's just I didn't know what was real. I seriously, you know, at the end of uh, Hunger Games, how PETA had to do the is it real, not real game. I had to do that for a year, over a year. I just I had no idea what was real anymore. She just completely just fudged my mind up. But all right, um, so let's start this off with a quote. Um, I said this because I finally came to the realization of this, and for some reason it helped me, even though it doesn't really seem like something that would help anyone. But I loved, full-heartedly, all in, but no, I was never loved. And I thought I was. That was the delusion. But when I first met her, she was really kind. She was into a lot of things I was in. And the first year was just beautiful, beautiful. We just went to new places, new discoveries. She seemed like she wholeheartedly loved me. She would hold my hand, which was new for me, which, you know, I was in my 20s at this point. So to just having your hand held in your 20s is pretty crazy. But that, that's, that, that's what I had. And I was grateful for what I had. I had hugs, kisses, you know. I just I finally got to experience all these things that I'd only heard of and legend before <laughs> and it she really brought me out of my shell I was able to go out and just start talking to cashiers you know before then I was so shy I had trouble even talking to cashiers I mean working at Walmart helped me through that a little bit but even then it was it was me forcing myself out of that shell and she brought me to a place where I actually naturally had the gumption to talk to people the I had that that energy that that confidence to do things. I felt like an actual person. For the first time in my life, I felt real. I felt like I wasn't this cursed being anymore, but I was an actual person who actually had love, who actually deserved it, who actually was good enough to have what everybody else has, you know? And after that first year, she got really, really, really jealous of my mother. And it's the weird, it's the stupidest thing, but how it all started was I was in the bathroom. Mom didn't know it. She opened it up to get something out of the closet in there. And then she ran out real quick. She didn't look. But because she'd walked in on me trying to get something, not realizing I was in there. It was my bad for not locking the door. But because of that, she started a almost three-year hatred campaign against my mom. And she didn't know it was real anymore. She thought that I was faking it. She thought that I was incestual. Yeah. I don't know how she got that from somebody walking on me in the bathroom. It was my freaking mom. But anyway. Um, so anyway, we had a huge fight for about a month over that. It was this huge back and forth. And I ended up leaving her. That, that's how we ended that. But I got thinking. And I was like, you know what? Well, maybe it wasn't a month. It was, it was a couple weeks. But it felt like a month. At least. But anyway, uh, I ended up just saying, no, that is not how it is. That is not the truth. <laughs> your mind is playing tricks on you. you. You've said yourself, you think your mind might be playing tricks on you. It is. There's nothing weird going on me and my mom. And it's like, okay. and then we kind of moved on from that. And I was like, you know what? I need to give her a second chance. It was a one-time thing. It was a weird misunderstanding. Her family's different. Her family isn't close like ours is. I mean, they, they barely even talk to each other. They all just kind of stay in their own rooms and don't even look at each other, which is honestly a red flag. But anyway, um, so I gave her another chance. And for about another six months, everything was great. Went kind of back to how it was that first year. Maybe not quite as good. She, uh, I had to earn back her trust. I had to earn back daily hugs. I had to earn back my love. But then I thought I had earned it. And Valentine's Day came along. Well, traditionally in my family, we get flowers for our elders, and then we go out to eat with the ones that we're dating. So I picked my mom up some flowers, asked, uh, asked her if she wanted flowers. She said no. She said, that's fine, they'll just die anyway. So I was like, okay. Got my mom the flowers and brought her out to dinner and spent the rest of the day with her. Didn't even go home, just spent the rest of the day with her. And that night she got really quiet. And she, every time I'd reach over to hold her hand or to kiss her or anything like that, she'd jerk away. So I knew something was wrong. I was like, well, tell me what's wrong. She said nothing. And she drug it on to the next day. 
Well, the next day comes along <laughs> and she tells me that I was a liar and that I was incestual with my mother because I got her flowers. I try to explain what's going on. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. I'm so sorry, you're, you're just, you're, you're perfect. I'm so sorry, I, that's, you never did anything wrong. It's just been my hallucinations, my mind. And, and cooled it down that way. I'm like, well, that was kind of a weird response, but maybe she's figuring out that she is overreacting with this whole situation. So we go on a couple more months and everything's good. Uh, we go to visit my parents a couple times, have dinner over there, um, go out to eat with them on, on Sunday brunch and all that, you know, just the usual family things. And she gets quiet again. She jerks away when I try to kiss her again. And then we end up in a three month battle of trying to convince her that I'm not incestual with my mother. <laughs> she was just so incredibly jealous of anybody else. And we fought through that and we got through that. And so what I ended up doing is not visiting my parents anymore. Just hanging out every day. I'd get up, I'd do my work stuff, I'd head out the door and I'd be with her the entire day. I'd be at her house or we'd be driving around going places. Every single day was hers. She had my undivided attention basically 24 seven. I even slept over there a few times. I mean, just at her place. It was just, it was basically a hundred percent devotion to her. And I thought that would fix things. I was willing to do that to fix things. Well, I worked for a while. And then she started talking about how controlling and evil my parents were and my brother. And she wanted me to go over and tell them off. I'm like, well, am I going to tell them off? We haven't even been over there. And then she caught my text. I'd have to hide my text because if she saw a text from my mom like, hey, you going to come over for dinner tonight? Or how you been? Or any, any kind of correspondence at all. And I would be punished. I mean, I would be brutally punished, screamed at, knocked over a balcony almost one time. <laughs> if, if she found out I was talking to my parents. Or my brother even. She would just, it would be it. I'd have to hide any correspondence with my family whatsoever or friends, anybody. And that just, that, that whole battle went on for about a year. And then, you know, I was, I, I, before that, that first year I'd actually gotten engaged to her because, you know, that first year was so perfect. I was like, well, this is the woman I want to be with forever. So we'd already been engaged for like two years at this point. I'm like, I kept asking her when we're going to get married. And she said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Kept putting it off. I'm like, I want you to be my wife. Like, uh, how can you not believe that I'm devoted to you? How could you think that I'm cheating on you with my family when I chose you? I spend every day with you. I want to be married to you. I chose you over everything. Maybe that was a mistake, but... And then she would throw back in my face how perfect I am. She actually called me God one time, which was really weird. She actually a few times called me God, which I'm like, oh, great. Again, another obsessive relationship problem. I, again, I put that on the sideline. I was like, well... Maybe we could work past that. I'm, I'm, I love her so much. I want to stay with her forever. I'm loyal to her. And we'll work through the that crap together. And just things kept coming up. Uh, then, then I started a D&D &D campaign with my brother. And she said she was okay with it. She was okay with me just hanging out with my brother for a few hours. But then I need to come back to her. But I started the D&D &D campaign with my brother. And he, there, was a, um, there was a female in the group. And keep in mind, she's a lesbian. She's not into guys at all. But she found out that there was a female in the group, ran up to me, and started accusing me of cheating, saying, how could you trust such a horrible, evil liar like me? I'm like, what are you freaking talking about? It's like, I saw her. You're checking her out, aren't you? She's hotter than me. And I'm like, oh, what? You realize she's a lesbian, right? And she's, oh. And then she shut me out for a week. She's like, well, I, I need a break. I need a break. So she shut me out for an entire week. So during that week, I'm just suffering. I'm crying. I'm just completely distraught because I did everything I could to make her life beautiful. I mean, I, I bought her stuff all the time. I brought her out to dinner every day, pretty much. Went downtown all the time. Just anything I could to make her day special every day. I wanted every day to be special. And it was just never enough. It was never enough. Because she was always convinced that someone else was going to take me. She didn't want me to have any correspondence, any communication with anybody but her. No friends, no family. If I had any communication with anybody that wasn't her or her family. But she even got weird about me talking to her family. If I didn't only speak to her, I'd be brutally punished for weeks on end. I would talk about how bad I am and then how good I am to reel me back in. How bad I was. She'd try all these different angles until she found something that worked. And eventually... I got to the point where she told me, she gave me an ultimatum. She said, you go home, you, you go to your parents, you uh, 
You tell them to stop trying to control your life. Tell them how evil they are and how they need to leave you alone and leave us alone so we can be happy or it's over. So I go to my parents. Uh, I tell them what ultimatum she gave me. Because I'd about had it at this point. I was, I was, I had all I could take, and I, it was still heartbreaking to do this. But I, I just told them what was happening, and then I went, and then I got everything all resolved. She brainwashed me. Honestly, I was in this weird mind space where I actually did believe it, and I'd said some horrible and done some horrible things to my parents and brother when they really didn't deserve it. Because over the course of years, she would sleep deprive me too. She'd keep me up all night so that I couldn't think properly I guess I don't know she would she would argue and talk these horrible things that didn't make any sense through for hours and hours on end till like 4 a.m. and then I had to get up at 7 so I wasn't getting any sleep at all but she wore me down so much that I eventually just started believing it somehow I don't even know how and I feel awful I feel like an awful person for having been talked into believing these delusions that she'd started but eventually I did and then, then and then I go to my parents, we talk it through, and I'd, be, I'd come out of it. I'd be like, wow, I, was, I could actually feel myself come out of like this veil that she had put me in, this, this brainwashed state. I'd actually feel myself coming out of it. And then I came back over there, and I was like, well, she's like, did you talk to them? I was like, well, I talked to them, but I mean, nothing was really that bad. I think we were just overreacting. And she got so angry. I mean, she just flared up. She grabbed me by the shirt, and that's when she almost threw me over the railing. She ran me over to the edge of a railing on her, on her balcony and almost pushed me over the edge. She's like, how dare you do that? And I guess she felt like she owned me at that point because we've been engaged for so long. And I told her she's basically my wife already, even if we're not married. So she thought she owned me, so she thought that would be okay, I guess. But after that, I was, I was done. So she told me she had to get one more chance. Go over to your parents and tell them off now. It's like, okay. I went over to my parents. I went to them. I said, I think I'm going to break up with her. She, she, she keeps giving me that ultimatum. She keeps trying to get me to go back into that mind space. She keeps trying to control me. She keeps telling me that you all are the ones controlling me. You are the ones brainwashing me. And I could see now that it's, it's her. It's, I mean, it's obviously. Unless I'm, I was in that sleep deprived state. Well, the problem was that I got away from her for a little while. So I started sleeping. Because she did another one of those week long, I'm not going to talk to you. But she would text me and try to get me to wake up in the middle of the night. Like 2, 3 a.m. She'd shoot me a text. Be like, hey, we need to talk. She was still trying that tactic. But I ignored it. And I kept sleeping. And then I got enough sleep where I was actually out of that state and I actually felt good enough to combat what she was talking about and really talk it through. So that morning, I, a couple days later, I called her and I was like, no, I think you're wrong. They're not trying to brainwash me. You just, you don't know what you're talking about. We could talk it through, but you're wrong. She said, they've got to you. They've gotten to you. They've brainwashed you. I can't believe you would allow this to happen. You're gone. They're taking you. They're controlling your life. You're not a man. You're not a man because you let other people control you. It's like, yeah, you're right. So that's why I'm not gonna let you control me anymore. And I hung up and I walked over to the trampoline and she started texting me that it's over. Things are over. It's, it's done. And I just, I lay on the trampoline, and I felt this new sensation, this new pain that I'd never felt before in my life. And I just started screaming, what is this? What is this? What is this? And I just, I felt like my chest, like my entire chest cavity had like this plate on it. And the plate was being ripped up and I could feel all these tiny, tiny threads being just decimated and ripped and sliced to pieces. And it was the most intense metaphysical pain and physical pain as far as whatever it was that I'd ever felt. And I think that was my first actual true heartbreak. Just I felt, I don't know, I felt dead. I felt like things were getting ripped away. Like my life was just ripping in half and new forms of depression I had never felt before just completely took me over. And she called and she tried to talk me out of it. She had me meet her at the park. She was steaming. Like it was actually, it was raining and there was actually steam coming off her. She was that mad at me. And I w she kept trying to talk me into it, and I just kept telling her I can't trust her anymore. I can't trust her. She told me she was done with that. She told me she'd move on with that, and she didn't. I'm sorry, I just can't trust you. She kept trying to talk me into it. It was hours. She kept trying to talk me into it. She kept me into it. She disappeared into the woods. I had to get one of the soldiers that were training at the park to go find her because I thought maybe she was going to kill herself because she was saying things like that. And we found her, and she was all right. But went back to the park. She kept trying to talk me out of it. Kept talking me out of it. Kept talking me out of it. I didn't think she was even going to let me go. She wasn't going to let me leave. I'm like, you're the one that broke up with me. 
I didn't break up with you. You said it's over. I told you I'd never leave you, and I didn't. You left me. It's over. I kept my end of the deal. I never broke up with you. You broke up with me. You ended it, and I can't trust you enough to take you back. So she gives me my engagement ring back. She drives off. It's like, that's that, you know? She said goodbye. Well, then she calls me again. She talk, starts talking about how I'm like this evil demon, this evil demonic creature who had taken everything away from her, who taken away the best years of her life and her innocence and her, her, the last of her childhood. And it's like, what the heck are you even talking about? I started dating you, you were 19. And at this point she was like 21. And I was, you know, I was, I was still, I was in my earlier 20s too. I mean, we were, we were similar in age. It wasn't a huge gap there. So it's not like I was just, she was tricked to me like I was a pedophile or something, but I wasn't. We'd, we'd make out and kiss and all that jazz, but you know, uh, we were around the same age. And we got along really well. We were at the same maturity level. Seriously, we were both adults. <laughs> we we're both consenting adults. And so anyway, but she acted like I was this awful thing. We talked about how she, her body felt so abused and so used up and bruised and how I'd done these awful things to her and she'll never get over me. She'll be alone forever now. She can never love anybody else and how I should just, I should take her back because I owe her that much. I promised her my heart. I gave her the ring. Like, you gave me that freaking ring back. You broke up with me and you gave me the ring back. You ended it, not me. You ended it. She just kept me on the phone over and over and over. She would call me. I'm so sorry. Uh, can we just make it up? I'll do anything to make it up to you. Can we just restart? Can we just lay down and watch Star Wars and restart? Just I feel so at peace, so home when I'm laying down beside you. And then about and then I'd say no, and I'd hang up. Not ten minutes later, she'd call back again with, "You're so evil. You're awful. How could you do this to someone? How could you be such a liar? You and your horrible, abusive mother. How could you? How could you do this to someone? How could you be like this?" And then she would hang up, and when that didn't work, she'd call with another nicety. Well, I've really thought about it, and we could, we could just be friends, and I just don't want to lose you as my best friend. And she was trying all the different tactics, trying to find something that worked, something she could hook me with and gain control of me again, and she couldn't do it. And it was driving her insane. And then she, there was stuff that her grandpa had given me. We were really close friends, and I lost him because of this, because there was no telling what the heck she told him, and I, I couldn't face that. But she had me give all of his drawings back that he'd given to me, to her and I got to keep some of his books that he'd given me thankfully but she took almost everything back and I'm not gonna get into the financial stuff but I, I'd, I'd given her joint access to my bank account and given her access to one of the credit cards and she, she paid all that back so there's no reason to worry about that but at this point I was starting to feel really used you know it's like everything I, I'd given my full self and beyond I've done this Herculean effort just to make it work hurting my family, giving up my family, putting my family behind her, putting everything behind her. And she was treating me like the bad guy, like I was awful and I didn't do enough. And just hit me with all these things. She started pulling up all those past abuses that I talked about. She started using the exact words of some of those kids that I told her about. She said that she gave me a chance, but what they said was true. And then I'll think about that, I'll think about this. I'll, this is my new thing to think about when I'm alone and sad. That, that someone gave me a chance and I blew it again. And that just completely just sent me into a weird spiral that I can't explain. But I spent about four hours on the ground rocking back and forth. Just <sighs> saying why and no and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just like, I, I snapped for a while. <laughs> I completely snapped. I don't know what I was doing. I just, I don't remember who I was. I completely lost who I was. I didn't remember who I was. I just, I knew that it was pain. That's all I knew was pain. I was just walking back and forth. She was still calling me and threatening me, threatening to tell my parents about all the th horrible things I'd done, tell all my friends about all, all, how awful I am, and warn every woman on Facebook and let everybody know how awful I am. And just all these threats, constant threats after that. Threat, 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 threat. So I just had to block her. I had to start blocking her on everything. Because if I didn't, she would continue to threaten me. And I was already in such a bad mental state. My entire body was freezing cold. I'd never had that happen in my life. My limbs felt like ice and I was shaking like this and I couldn't stop. I was shaking that intensely and I could not stop. And my teeth were chattering, and I couldn't sleep. And, and just, well, I ended up talking to somebody about it later, and they said that all of my blood had receded to my organs to try to defend me because I thought I was going to die. <laughs> That's how distressed I was. <sighs> but I, just, I, I tried. Even then, I was like, well, maybe I can give her another chance. And just every time I would think about it, she'd call and threaten me again. I was like, well, I can't. She's pushing me away at every time I even give her a chance. Even if I do see her as my wife, it's, it's going to have to be a divorce. And that's what it felt like. 
because I'm stuck in an abusive relationship. And that's when I realized it. I didn't realize it until then because I was so dedicated to her that I didn't allow myself to see it. And I allowed, I feel so awful that I allowed so many people to suffer for the sake of my selfish relationship. But it was the only one I ever had. It's the only one that ever worked. It's the only one that ever lasted. It's the only deep connected connection I've ever had with anyone in 20 plus years. And I thought it was my only chance and it might've been. I just wasn't willing to give it up. When I had my one chance, I wasn't willing to give it up. But she forced me to give it up. I wasted so many years. And I broke down. And there was a year where I just didn't work. I just didn't want to. I wanted to die. I laid there. I wouldn't eat. I wanted to die. I continued to lose weight. And I was hoping that I would just be able to help my friends out. To do the stuff that Jeremy wanted me to do. To do that whole GPR story. And then die at the end. I wanted I wanted to finish what I owed everyone else in my life that I loved, that I'd let down. Parents and brother, everyone included. And then when I was done, I was going to drive out to a park. I was going to walk as long as I could until I passed out. And I was going to become part of the park. That was my plans. I was done. I didn't want to live anymore. Life was bad. Existence was evil. Existence was pain. Existence was awful. I hated to exist. I hated to live so much. Love was just the most horrible, evil thing I could think of. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. I, hated it. I, I had a punch bag, and I would just beat the heck out of it just thinking about love. I hated it. It was just pain, and it was neglect, and it was rejection. That was weird. A tree is about to break or something. But, but it wasn't fair. It wasn't right of me. There is good love out there. Maybe not for me, and that's okay. That's why I've got my books. That's why I've got my creativity. My body provided for me. And I'm grateful for that. It's good enough. But it's just in that moment, I was so distraught. I allowed myself to get into some incredible debt. Because I just wasn't willing to work. I didn't, I didn't care. I, my plan was to die. So why, if I was going to die in a year, why would I take the time to take care of myself and my finances? I mean, it was stupid. Why waste time when I was going to die anyway? And then during that, I met some really good friends. Friendly and user and... C and K and Vexus and, you know, <laughs> Zeus, all of you wonderful people. And I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to die. I think I want to make this work. This is a dream from my childhood, having a successful YouTube, having my books published. You know, I was like, I've still got my childhood dreams. I've still got something. I'm not completely broken. I'm not, I haven't lost everything yet. I've still got one thing. I've still got this. I've still got my creativity. So I'm going to foster this. I'm going to live for my creativity. If I can't live for anything else, I'm going to live for that. And it was good enough. And so that's what I did. That's what I've been doing. And during that, I came out of that depressive state. I'm not depressed anymore. For the first time in a long time, I'm not depressed anymore. And I don't feel that need to have that connection just to survive and to feel real. I feel real. Finally, feel real. And I'm moving on from that. I'm moving away from the suicidal tendencies. I'm moving away. I've gotten chubby, but <laughs> a little bit, but I'm not too bad. But I've, I've gotten away from the uh, anorexia. I've gotten away from a lot of mental disorders and mental stress. And the problem I'm having right now is I'm trying to recover from the financial damage that I did to myself, which is going to take a while, which is I'll probably have to tack on some odd jobs until I get that all taken care of. But I'm going to do my best to try to maintain everything and move forward. I mean, that's about the best case scenario you can get from a situation like that, you know? When someone completely tries to destroy you so that they can have you. And you know, I should have been warned earlier because she's extremely abusive to her parents and her brother. She has them wrapped around her finger and if they go against anything she says, she tells them off. She, she, she actually told me one time, you gotta learn to control your parents. Tell them what's what. So then, I should have realized she was controlling and narcissistic. I should have. But again, I was blinded by that love. Love does blind you. It's true. It's absolutely true. Because you don't want to believe it. Because you love that person so much. But that was the truth. But anyway, I'm past that now. I'm away from that now. I'm recovering. I'm not there, but I'm recovering. And I don't tell you all the story for sympathy. Not at all. If anything comes of this, what I want to come of this is I want to encourage you all to never give up and to find that strength, to find whatever it is that is worth living for and cling to ever freaking crap to that. No matter what it takes, no matter what you have to sacrifice as far as like what you think you have to do, if you found something worth living for, and nothing else brings you that, you cling to that, because that's what you're made to do. And you focus on that. Love will find you if it wants you. 
but you are the only one that can make your dreams come true. And you know, once you have your dreams, you're good enough surviving there. So then you're not so heavily dependent. You're not so obsessively reliant on someone else just to survive. Then you could have a true healthy relationship because then you can see these signs. You're like, oh, well, I probably shouldn't be with someone who has these narcissistic tendencies. I've already got my happiness, so I'm going to move on and find someone else. Because when all you have is them, and it's something she tried to get again, but once all you have is them, you're willing to put up with a lot more because if you don't, you lost it all. So just keep that in mind. Keep in mind to stay away from those people and to find what makes you happy before you find who makes you happy. Otherwise, you'll end up, you could end up in the same situation. Just be careful. Love is a dangerous, dangerous game, and it can kill you. It's not this big, beautiful picture, and that's what I learned, and it's sad, but it's not this big, beautiful, movie-esque fantasy. It's, it's a commitment. It's a journey. And a lot of the times, that journey will put you right into the dragon's mouth. So just be careful. Be careful. Love is not always kind. True love is. But there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing out there. I love you all. Thank you all for listening. Sorry if I ruined your day with this. I just, it feels really important and I'm finally, finally, finally strong enough to talk about it. And I have a lot, a lot of the reason I'm able to do this is thanks to Repzilla. The interview we had, it really gave me the strength to finally speak out. So thank you for giving me strength. Thank you all for listening. Hope you all have a great day and a great weekend. And I can't wait to see you all in the future. We'll continue growing together. We'll get stronger together and we'll, we'll make something out of this. Thanks again.